So, I'm Rin. I'm Scott. We're the hosts of Geek Nights, a late night podcast for geeks. If you like this at all, there's flyers out there. We've got videos of most of our lectures for the last many years at PAXs. We'll probably have a video of this one up too. People on the internet will know if we did that or not. And we're here to talk about game theory, which is interesting because we talk about game theory a lot. On and Geek we Nights. talk we, about it and act like we know a lot more than we do. We'll get right up to the point where we talk about the math, and then we say, but the rest of it isn't that important, and we move on. Because we just read the Wikipedia, and now we're going to tell you what we read on Wikipedia because you didn't read it. And you're going to think we're really smart. We reference game theory a lot, and the problem is that we, we always talk about how useful game theory is. And it is useful in games, but it is not really about the things you think it's about. You think game theory, I'm going to study games. You're studying games in the same sense that if you like race cars, you can go and study, I don't know, carburetors. So what is game theory? Game theory is actually a very recent mathematical field that is used in a bunch of other areas. It's used in war, it's used in biology, it's used in politics. And really, all game theory is, is the idea that you can study and describe and maybe even predict the behavior of rational actors making decisions and maybe cooperating, maybe competing. It's actually a fairly open field. I mean, almost everything you do is some sort of cooperation or competition, and you're making some sort of decisions, you believe in free will at least. Now, game theory in terms of games is a little tricky because the math is usually not useful, like really not useful. You'll study all the math of The Prisoner's Dilemma. It's not going to help you win games. So what we want to do is take all the lectures we've done for the last many years and talk about how to actually use this game theory stuff we talk about all the time and actually apply it to games and not hawks and doves fighting over who gets to eat whom. So game theory actually has its origins if we talk about what we're talking about with the Prussians, the military powerhouses of the 1700s, the 1800s, 1900s, not so much after that. Yeah, one of, pretty much most of our society comes from these crazy people, right? I mean, just, you know, the art of war, but not the Sun Tzu art of war, right? Our school system. The idea all... of public education as we have it today came out of Prussian military academies. Yeah, I mean, all wargaming, period, on tables. So it's funny you mentioned wargaming because this is a very old picture, but it's a picture of something that you might see in a tabletop library today. Wargaming, as we know it today, existed back in the, in the year 1812 with a game called Kriegsfeld, which means war game. <laughs> now this game, if you saw people playing it in tabletop today, it has dice, it has a game master, it has red pieces versus blue pieces with rules about moving around a board. It is a modern war game. You can go read the rules to this and play it today. This game was used to train military officers in Prussia to be better at doing military things, AKA killing people. Now, this is very important. Games are used, you know, we think of games as fun. But look at biology, play. The idea of play generally is animals learning how to fight or survive without the consequences of failing to fight or survive properly, aka dying. Oh, that sucks. So we can play Risk and study, you know, how war works and learn risk about is war. Risk nothing like war. <laughs> without having to actually go to war and die. So Prussia got the idea very early on that they could train, they could do military exercises, and then they could go one step further and simulate battles and study how war will work on tables with funny dice. And this turned into a hobby in Prussia independent of its use in the military. But the core thing to remember is that the games we're talking about came out of a tradition of trying to use games to simulate reality, to be able to learn from our mistakes without being killed by them. And it's weird that today we play games, but we're not trying to sort of simulate reality with a lot of, I mean, I guess Flight Simulator, if you, right? Stuff like that. Starcraft. But, right, when I play Puerto Rico, how am I applying that in everyday life? I'm not. I'm just trying to win at Puerto Rico itself. The game is the means and the end, you know, well, especially we've moved, at PAX. We've moved beyond the Kriegspiels to the point where we're playing games purely for enjoyment. But if you play games enough, you'll start to understand the sort of real-world ramifications and the underpinnings of these games. And as a result, you'll get a lot better at games. Now, game theory, in quotes, game theory with a capital G and a capital T that you, you know, we talk about all the time, that actually didn't really exist until around the 1920s. And it didn't exist in the form we know it today until as late as the 50s. It's a very new field compared to other things. Almost as new as video games. And the two Johns, John von Neumann, or Neumann, depending on how you pronounce it, and John Forbes Nash, who is still alive, 
I'm not going to get into the history of game theory and like where it really came out of, but these two people kind of founded the idea of modern game theory, that you could take the decisions that rational actors make, codify them with math, and study them and figure out things about them. You'll see these names all over if you study game theory. People call toy game theory games von Neumann games to this day. Nash equilibria, you'll hear that term thrown out all the time. These two dudes are relatively recent to the field, and they, this field is relatively recent to the world. Now, game theory, at its core, has some problems. It assumes some things. You all know what happens when you assume. <laughs> so, one, game theory assumes that everyone involved acts rationally. And two, that they're all acting in their own best self-interest. So you can see how already, if you were to just go by game theory when playing all games, it would fail all the time. Because number one, and none of your opponents are going to be rational. Right? Everyone you play against is doing dumb stuff, right? And they don't know they don't know what the best move is, even if it's obvious, right? Yep. So they do that and suddenly all your game theory goes out the That window. guy keeps trading wood with his girlfriend because he wants her right. to win. Well that's the self interest part, right? Is the, the rationally is doesn't know the best move. The we'll self, tell right? The self interest is, you know, some guy who's playing counter strike, he doesn't want to win the counter strike, which would be in his self interest. He just wants to shoot his friends in the head and team kill, right? And it's like game theory doesn't account for that either. Now the real world too. The difference between these war games and game theory, why they're distinct, is that war games tried to simulate reality and then use that to teach people how to deal with reality or teach figure out how reality works. Game theory tries to figure out how perfect people act in a perfect world. So I want to talk about these assumptions because it's very important. These assumptions imply a lot of things that you might not realize. The whole point of this discussion is that we're going to try to show you the practical side of game theory. Game theory assumes people act rationally. That means that your opponents in a game should or could be just as clever as you. That is a huge assumption. If you've ever played chess and you moved your bishop out a little bit and you're kind of hoping he didn't notice and that he might move a guy there later, that's not game theory. You should assume when you're playing games that everyone at the table is just as smart as you, that you cannot hide the existence of a strategy from them. They have figured out that maybe you're going to put the bomb in the back corner of Stratego surrounded by bombs. <laughs> if you think they haven't figured that out, you're not thinking like a game theorist. You're thinking like a normal gamer, and you don't want to be a normal gamer. You came to PAX, and instead of playing games or watching whatever's going on in the main theater, you're here talking about game theory in this room. You waited in line for this. I don't know why. All right. <laughs> so rational people are playing logically. They're Vulcans. They're clever. They're just as clever as you. Think about that. Think about, imagine playing Settlers of Catan with three of yourself. Who wins? Self-interest. It assumes that you are trying to win the game. You're not trying to let your boyfriend win the game because you expect something later. You're not trying to flash your teammates. You are trying to win the game by the rules of the game, which means we have to define some game theory terms. Words in game theory, there's a whole lexicon of words that have very specific meanings. Utility is the carrot. It's what you're after in a game. Right, so in a game where there's victory points, right, you're after winning, but the key to winning is victory points, right? You try to get the most victory points. If you don't try to get the most victory points, maybe you just try to get money, and money isn't victory points. You're not, have the, you don't have a different utility than everyone else has. Now think about the implications in gaming. If someone's trolling in a game, they're seeking a different utility from what the game told them to. Hey, we're going to play the prisoner's dilemma, and he just punches you in the face. He's playing the punching game. <laughs> Anytime someone is not playing to win, they're not playing like a game theorist. Their game theory suddenly breaks down. It's hard to analyze that game because that player is acting irrationally. Now think about that. In a perfect world, nobody acts irrationally. But you're at PAX. You know what's up. Yeah, so like sometimes I, I played a Netrunner deck I made, right? And I didn't try to win with this deck. There was just this weird combo that did a silly thing that didn't actually make you win. It only helped you win a little. But I did it anyway just to make it be silly. I was like, ah, we. So think about this when you're playing games. If someone else doesn't appear like they're trying to win, you try to figure out what they're after, what their utility is, and then use that knowledge to win. Imagine trying to figure out when other players are acting irrationally and take advantage of their irrationality. We'll talk about that more later, but just remember, utility is victory points. Game. We were at MAGFest, and we tried to define what a game is on a panel with a bunch of gaming industry experts. And you know what? People got mad in the audience when you dared to say that watching a movie might not be a game. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. Right, but in game theory, right, a game has an extremely strict definition in the context of game theory, right? 
Uh, first of all, a game in game theory has to have multiple players. Anything that is single player is not a game in game theory. End of story. It's period. a puzzle, not a game. Right, or something else is not a game unless it has two people because game theory is all about what decision do you make based on the decision the other person could make. If there's no other person to make a decision, then it's not a game anymore. It's just you solving the math problem, the end. But Rim and Scott, you're thinking, what about AI? One, shut up. <laughs> Pedan if we want to be pedantic and really get into you know, the idea of what is a man, what does it mean to be sentient, all those things, we're trying to be practical about this. The ivory tower side of game theory is awesome, but that's not what we're here to talk about. So think of AI, if you can't distinguish it from another person, fine, it's a game theory game. If you can figure out it's AI, then no, it's not a game theory game. Or it is, and you're just going to assume that it's a player who's dumb and follows a strategy. Right. In the real world today, every AI is not a real AI, so you could know what it's going to do, so it is, in effect, just a really, really hard puzzle that is hard to differentiate, whatever. Now, humans might or might not have free will. We could get into all that, but... Yeah, are you, you even an AI, right? If the only argument you can make about anything is the low-level solipsistic, what does it mean to be alive, then shut up. <laughs> <laughs> The game has to be interactive. You have to actually interact with the other players or we're not talking about it. If we're playing versus Solitaire, whoever wins first, it's not a game theory game. We're not, we have nothing to say about versus it. Versus Progress Quest, let's go. <laughs> I started in 1990. Start now. <laughs> Both of us. The game has to involve decisions. You have to make a decision at some point. Now you might have decided what you're going to decide ahead of time. That's called a strategy, we'll get to that later. And the game has to have payoffs. It has to have victories. Someone has to win. Someone has to lose. You have to get something. Poker, you win some money. There has to be something that you can get more of than someone else or we're not talking right. about. If it. you play tag, it's like, well, when does the game of tag end? Is there a winner? It's just someone who's it all the time, but there's no winning ending. It's not a game theory game. I just read an article in the Times about a group the, of guys who've been, been playing. playing for, yeah. They've been playing tag the for like 40 years. Right. So <laughs> you need, the game has to have, sure, the game has to have a winning, an ending, a victory, a, a, a prize, you know, some way to, you know, to end, and there you go, the results. So, and Don't remember know. this in general, whenever you're talking about games, there are different definitions of all these words, but if you want to have a serious discussion, you have to define the terms you're going to use ahead of time, so you're not arguing about, well, what if I play a drinking game while I'm watching a movie? That makes that movie a game. No, shut up. <laughs> Strategy. I use that word. That word means something very, very specific. In game theory, a strategy means I'm going to Hadouken constantly, but if he gets close to me, you see where I'm going with this. A strategy means you have decided what you're going to do for the entire course of the game. I have a rock, paper, scissors strategy. Rock. Okay. Yeah. I lose. I lose. That is a strategy. A strategy means you have already made every decision you're going to make before the game starts. Your decision was, what strategy will I right. use? Well, it's, it's not necessarily that you've decided, right? It's that a strategy is a complete set of all the decisions, right? So in chess, if you said, I'm going to, you know, you, you have a complete set, this one there, then this one there, then this one there, then this one there, and you plan, you know, it's got the plan for the whole game. That is strategy number one. And let's say you take that exact same strategy and you say, well, it's going to be the exact same thing, except on the last turn, the pawn will move one space less. All right, well, that's strategy number two. And if you figure out every possible set of moves, right, for any particular game, that is the, you know, complete strategy set, every move you can make. And for a game like chess, we haven't calculated the whole thing yet, but for checkers, we We may have. never calculate the whole thing. It's not likely in our lifetime we will. We'll get to that. So in Street Fighter, if I Hadouken one millisecond differently, that's a totally different strategy. Yep. So practically, you're not going to have a pure game theory strategy when you play games. But you'll have a colloquial strategy. I'm going to Hadouken the shit out of him, and that's all I'm doing. <laughs> that works surprisingly well. Against people who don't know how to jump, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the whole point of this is that <laughs> there are games in game theory. And if you want to study this stuff for real, go to Wikipedia and look for the list of game theory games. There's like a hundred of them there. Those games are not fun to play, nope. but those games exist inside of the games you play every day. So if you study those games, you'll recognize when an analogous game like those games exists in your other games. So you're playing a game while you're playing a game. So now remember, every one of these game theory games meets the requirements of the true game theory definition of game, right? It's a multiplayer game, you make decisions, there's a payout, there's a winner. 
right? And when studying those games and what to do in them, you're assuming the rational actors, people trying to win and not trying to do whatever else. So, the prisoner's dilemma. Now, there's a whole description of the prisoner's dilemma. People bring this up in every talk about game theory because everyone knows it. Super simple. Rather than using the classical definition, I want to use a definition from a game you might have all played when you were young. Now, it's not a game theory game, obviously, but this, you know, people, you'd argue this is a game. It's more, it's no more, less of a game than a Final Fantasy in some senses. Is but the in author this game, any other player? Shut up. <laughs> so in this, in this game, you're a kid and you have a magic bike. So you get invited to be in the bike race. And you and another kid, Scott and I will play this right now. So the guy comes over and says, we each get a piece of paper. You write apple or orange. If you both write apple, you both get into the bike race. If you both write orange, neither one of you gets into the bike race. If one of you writes apple and the other one writes orange, the guy who wrote orange goes home, the guy who wrote apple gets 500 bucks and gets in the bike race. And the options the game gives you are write apple, write orange, wink at the other player and write apple, wink at the other player and write orange. That is the prisoner's dilemma. You are competing with someone else in some sense. You can cooperate to mutual benefit or you can defect against the other person. And if you do so, you get a much larger payout at their expense. But if you both defect, you're both fucked. You might see on YouTube there was a clip from some British game show. I think it was like Split or Steal, right? And basically it's the exact same thing. You, they had two balls. They either do the split ball or the steal ball. If they both do the split ball, then they split this money evenly as a prize. If one guy does the steal ball and the other splits, the steal guy gets all the money. And if they both steal, they get nothing, right? So this genius went on the show and was like, I'm going to steal. You and the other guy's like, what? What do you mean? It's like, I'm going to steal. There's nothing you can do about it. I've already decided. Right. I've I'll decided, split the money with I've you. I've decided 100% I'm going to steal. Your two choices are steal and neither of us gets anything. Or you split, I take all the money, and I will promise I will give you half of it after. But you'll have to, right? So there's the only chance of you getting any money at all is because I'm going to steal is to play split and let me have the money. If you pick steel, neither of us will get any money. I won't be able to share it with you, right? Now, threats and signaling and things like that, we're going to talk about in depth in a little bit. But just on this, so it turns out that there's a prisoner's dilemma <laughs> hidden inside of El Grande. El Rim's Grande is a game with a whole Rim's bunch of... favorite game. Eh, there's a copy of it right there. That, <laughs> Scott doesn't necessarily agree with me. If you want to learn all these like sub-game theory games, El Grande is probably the best game to learn this stuff with because it has so many of these little games in it. So in El Grande, one aspect of it is there is a rondel that is used as a secret spinner. So say I'm red and Scott's blue, or we can switch them. It doesn't really matter. If you select a territory, you have a bunch of dudes, like troops, you can throw into that territory. Scott and I could both collaborate to say, yo, I'll put all my troops on green, you put all your troops on green, we'll both benefit because our homeland, we get to score it with the extra points, and green screwed. We knock him out of the game, now it's a 50-50 shot which one of us wins in the end. We could collaborate. Or maybe we say we're going to collaborate, and then Scott attacks me anyway. Now, yeah, green. I know he's going to green for sure, right? I say, yeah, sure. And then I see, well, if he goes to green, red's wide open. I'm going red. So we have to decide, are we going to defect or not? Will I defect against Scott? Will he defect against me? Now, this gets really interesting for a lot of reasons. One, we can cooperate. If we cooperate, we change our chance of winning in a three-player game of El Grande from 33% well, 33.333, you get the idea, to 50%, and Green's just out. Nothing he can do. But simultaneously, I can turn my chance into almost 100% if I betray Scott. But if Scott betrays me and I betray him, now that Green's going to win. That third player is going to win. So oh. it's the same thing. It's the prisoner's dilemma happening as this one <coughs> tiny sub-game inside of El Grande. If you know how the prisoner's dilemma works, you're going to be good at El Grande. So in El Grande, if I wanted to say, Rim, I'm going to pick red. I'm going to pick red. If you pick green, I will give you half of the red. Now, if you ever watch us play games, you'll see me and Scott. We'll be playing with a bunch of like listeners or fans in the tabletop somewhere. And I'll look at Scott and I'll be like, apple, apple. <laughs> and then I betray him anyway. That's just how you do. Yeah. So <laughs> the word cooperative 
you know, we're going to define some more terms, does not mean what you think it means. Right. Well, in game theory, it doesn't, right? If someone says co-op game, you're thinking Double Dragon, right? Double Dragon is not a cooperative game in the game theory land. In the game theory land, for a game to be cooperative, right, people need to be able to form teams and win together and both receive the result, the reward. So think about this. Cooperative, now we're not talking about Shadows Up or Camelot or any no, of those kinds of no. games. Don't even get me started. No. Cooperative has such a specific meaning. Like Scott said, binding coalitions. In Monopoly, if I could make a deal with you, like, yo, if you land on Boardwalk, I won't charge you, and the game forces that to happen, extrinsic enforcement, the rules say that is what happens, then Monopoly becomes a cooperative game. Games are cooperative if you can make deals, and those deals are in the rules of the game. Now, I've made deals with people in games like Risk before. Or Diplomacy. Doesn't work out so well, does it? So... There's nothing in the game that says you have to do that. So, what is it? There's nothing. You're basically just talking. So in El Grande, I can say all I want about whether or not we're going to cooperate. I totally won't attack you. That means nothing. And if you're a good player, you realize that if you're playing a non-cooperative game, anything anyone says means nothing. So... Non-cooperative games. If we're talking about non-cooperative games, it's pretty much every goddamn game out there. Almost no games actually have game theory cooperation in them. Especially well, Civ, you can make alliances. So we'll get to that. <laughs> in games like Diplomacy or Civ, you can make alliances in the course of the game. You can break alliances, but it's hard to make complex binding deals like, I won't attack Australia for 10 rounds. I promise I will never attack you in Asia as long as Scott is still in the game. You can make all these kinds of things, and people love to make these cooperative deals, but games are only cooperative if the rules say. So is the real world cooperative? Real world games, like I'm going to sign a contract to be at PAX and do this lecture. Well, it depends, right? On the one hand, we could sign a contract, but then not do it. And nothing stop, physically prevents us from doing it. But ah. there is a post-enforcement of the police who will come and There is you. extrinsic enforcement. Contract law, in the United States at least, is effectively a cooperative game. Because if I break the rules of the contract, the government comes and does something to me. And if I don't want to do what the government says, then the government's guns come and do something. In the end, <laughs> guns force me to do what I said I'll do, or some compensation comes out. So the world is effectively cooperative in society because we have laws, we have structures. If you don't cooperate in PACs, the enforcers will do something about it. So what happens if you make a game cooperative? Why aren't games cooperative? There aren't that many cooperative games because they make games very different. In Doom, you can form an alliance of players. Whenever and, the sandworm appears. And you win collectively. You all just win together if you your group can win. It's just three on one, maybe, if the other players couldn't form a coalition. Imagine Monopoly if you could make for real deals. Imagine Risk if you could make for real deals. So whenever you're looking at a game and someone's trying to make a deal with you, consider whether or not that deal is actually binding. Yo, dog, I'll totally give you wood the next time I have it in Settlers, but I don't have any right now if you give me a stone now. I'll gladly pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. That's not gonna happen, bro. And what if you never get a wood for the rest of the game? I'm gonna get wood. Are you? <laughs> you have it now? So, let's talk a little bit about so-called cooperative games, or as I like to call them, bad games. I don't like these games, and here's why. If you're playing Pandemic, assume no expansions, assume no traders or anything weird, you're all trying to win, right? So one, it's not a game theory game. Two, there is no incentive to not share all the information you have. So as a result, Games like this tend to break down to the one guy who figured out how to play perfectly telling everyone else what to do. That's not fun. People get mad and try to limit that communication, but they're limiting themselves. They're giving them, they're basically handicapping themselves. The game itself gives you no incentive to not do exactly yeah. what the smart guy says. This game is really just a solitaire game, but what they do is they say, well, it's a solitaire game, but we're going to split up the turn into four pieces and each person takes a different part of the turn. Right? There's no actual cooperation necessary at all. It's really just yeah. What well, I'm gonna betray Scott? I said in the Shadows of Camelot, I said I got a bunch of good cards, then I just don't play them, and we lose. Great, I lost too. Yeah, it you know it's just a puzzle that's slightly different every time, and you solve it together with your friends. But usually, one person can solve the whole thing because it's not that hard a puzzle. But Rim and Scott, games like Shadows of Camelot have a traitor, so there is someone you're playing against. Nope. Because those games, if you do share all your information, 
either the trader's not going to share with you and you know he's the trader and you're going to win, or sharing the information guarantees mathematically you know who the trader is. So games like this, especially games that have traders, force you with usually very poorly written rules to not share information. You can't in Shadows Over Camelot tell people, yo, I have five of this card in my hand. If the rules say you can't. You have to be vague. I got this. I don't got this. I need a little bit of help. They're just obfuscating the fact that there's no game going on. So... I'm sure everyone who loves Pandemic's upset now. Yeah, you're probably upset. That's I'm tough. Sorry. So signaling. This is what we're talking about. In game theory, there's a concept of signaling. Signaling is when, in Shadows Over Camelot, you say, I have five of this card. It's when in any game you tell the other player something else. I'm going to throw rock the next time we play Paper, Rock, Scissors. Are you? Yes. Can I trust you? You lied. <laughs> so there is a game theory game called The Signaling Game. And guess what? Signaling means jack. <laughs> signaling means basically nothing. So the problem with these games is that there's no disincentive to signal, so signaling is the optimal strategy. But in versus games, signaling generally doesn't actually bind anyone to anything. Now the question is, is there ever a case where you would actually want to signal and it could benefit you? So for example, in Paper, Rock, Scissors, is there ever a case where signaling could help me out? So only in terms of psychology, only in terms of trying to wig the guy out. But game theory, he's just as clever as me. He knows that the only way to win Paper, Rock, Scissors is to play randomly, so it's not gonna work. So here's a better question. Can I make a threat in a game like Paper, Rock, Scissors? Is there a way to threaten the other player without actually threatening to punch them with my rock fist? <laughs> right, it's like, watch out, man. Next turn, I'm throwing rock. You watch out. It's going to be rock. <laughs> Beware. <laughs> so signaling is distinct from making threats. Threats are a very interesting part of games because you cannot make credible threats unless there is one of three conditions present. One, you're playing a game more than once. In Small World, to give you an example from a real game, or Vinci if you played the original, I always threaten anyone who's coming on the board with the new civilization. It's like if you come, when you're coming onto the board this turn, if you come on to my civilization, I will basically lose this game and destroy you and only try to destroy you and not try to win anymore. I might lose the first few games of Small World because I'm doing right. this. But eventually people learn that you actually do this. And then they stop coming in on top of you. And now you win because their choice is to either, if they attack you, they lose too, or don't attack you, letting you win. So in repeat play, you can make credible threats in games. There's a whole mathematical theory yeah. around threats. This only works if you play the game more than once. Now You need to establish the precedent. Think about all the ramifications of that. Say we play the Prisoner's Dilemma once. I can't make a threat because whatever. Say I, we play Prisoner's Dilemma ten times. Well... If I threaten, look, if you defect on me, I'll defect the rest of the game. I'll defect forever. So maybe Scott cooperates and I cooperate. All good. So now by both of us cooperating, we're king-making. We're going to win. Is there any reason for me not to defect on the 10th turn? He can't punish me for it. We know so, it's exactly 10 games. We know the 10th game is the last game. So I should just defect on the 10th turn. Now I get more points. I know he's going to defect on the last turn. Because, because he's just I as clever as me. That's right. Nobody's got any smarts more than anyone else does. We're both completely rational. We both know this is the last turn. His threat is completely worthless So now. he defects on the ninth turn. But I know he knows. So I defect on the eighth turn. You see where this goes and everybody loses. It's the scene from the Princess Bride. The second, it is the scene from the Princess Bride. The second way to make a credible threat is psychology. This isn't game theory, but it's psychology. You can wig people out. You can play head games with people, and it totally works in the real world. The third way, and the reason I have a picture of a steering wheel here is an example used in the previous panel. Let's say we're playing the game of chicken. It's got to be in cars. <laughs> Classic chicken, 1950s rocker chicken. We're going to drive cars at each other. Whoever swerves loses. So if we both swerve, we both lose. If neither one of us swerves, we both die. <laughs> if Scott swerves and I don't, I get the girl. And vice versa. So let's try to make a threat. I'm not going to swerve. I take my steering wheel and throw it out the window. I'm not going to swerve. So what has Scott done? He's changed the nature of the game. He is basically, by taking his steering wheel out, he's removed his own agency. He didn't tell me what he's going to, he did not signal what he's going to do. He already did it. 
I, can't, I have no choice but to swerve and lose the game be, or to die along with Scott. So I'm going to swerve. Scott's going to get the girl, but I'm not going to die. The decision was already made. The whole like quantum state of the game collapsed down, and the game was ruined. So the way to tell if signaling is good in a game or not, right, is it will help you in a game, is show someone your move. If showing someone your move makes you win, signaling is good in that game. If showing someone your move makes you lose, signaling's bad in that game. Let's do rock, paper, scissors. I signal. I've already thrown the rock. That didn't help me at all, did it? <laughs> no. But throwing the steering wheel out the window totally helps me. Makes me win. Makes the only choices for him is die and lose. So just keep in mind the difference between signaling and making threats. And threats have to be credible. In game theory, if a threat isn't credible, it does not exist. It's not a threat, it's just head games. So to use another game, one of these toy games, we're talking about a game called Goofspiel. Now Funny this name. game exists in many places. It's also known as the game of pure strategy or GOPS. And it's a very simple game. And guess take, what? It's in El Grande. Room you take game. a deck of cards and you split it up. So you have three players. You give each player a suit. So spades, hearts, diamonds. Then you take the clubs, you put them in the middle, you shuffle. Every turn, you flip one of those cards up randomly. It's worth the number of points of its face value. You all secretly bid one card from your hand. Whoever played the highest card gets it. In the case of a tie, no one gets the card, and you continue. It's known as the game of pure strategy, because what is your strategy in playing this game? And it might seem like a really simple game, but it's actually not. How am I going to, with, the, we all have the same amount of cards. We all have one ace, we all have one king. How am I going to get more points than the other person? So if you study this game, you'll find out that it exists in a bunch of other games. In fact, the game it exists in, I might have signaled this, <laughs> is El Grande. A mechanic of El Grande is you have bidding cards. These bidding cards determine who goes first in picking roles. They also determine some other things. So the lower cards that let you go last... They have they more people on them. They give you more stuff. But the point is that you are basically bidding, just like Goosefield, from this hand of cards to decide the order of play. We played El Grande so much we figured out that people tended to win if they went first in the third round because they could move the king and the king gave them extra points. So people would want to have their 13 through the whole game and play it in the third round. But because turn order determined who got to bid first and you couldn't play a card that was a tie, you would have to go last in the second to last round, meaning you had to go first in the third to last round. So it became this musical chairs of bidding and it was just Goofspiel. If we had learned about Goofspiel and played it and studied it, we could have won El Grande. Now, Goosheville is an actual game. You can play it. Just grab a deck of cards, get three people, and try to bid on and win the most points of cards. Yeah, now you might think, well, to get the ace, i got to bid the ace, right? Well, what if somebody else right, decides, well, you know what? For the ace, I'm going to bid the two. And for the king, I'll bid the ace. And for the queen, I'll bid the king. Right? It's like, yeah, I'll let someone else have the ace. I took every other single card by bidding one above. Well, we could take that a step further. Okay, I won't bid on the king or the ace. I'll just get the queen on down by bidding the ace on the queen and so forth, right? And eventually you're bidding the ace on the two. <laughs> now it gets much more subtle than this because there, this is a game of strategy, a game of pure strategy. What if someone's acting completely randomly? Completely randomly. They just shuffle up their Gooshville cards without looking and bid. Now on one hand, that might seem like a very good strategy. It is trivially beaten by a little more complex strategy. Always play the card that is the face value of the card that came up. But that strategy doesn't work against a player who's not acting randomly, because if I see Scott doing that, I play N plus one. And you can see how that escalation happens. Well, I'll always beat him by one, but he knows I'll beat him by one, so he'll beat me by two. So that cycle and that strategy, what is the good strategy to play this game? If you can figure that out, you can win a lot of board games and a lot of other games that include Gooshfield inside of them. But the key there, how do you figure out what someone else is doing? How do you figure out if another player is acting rationally? If you can figure out that someone's dumb or irrational, you can use that to your advantage. So Colonel Blotto. I couldn't find a picture of an actual colonel whose name was Blotto. I was very disappointed in this. <laughs> the Colonel Blotto game <coughs> exists in El Grande. Oh, you don't say. Colonel Blotto is a very simple game. <laughs> say you have three regions and you have 10 troops. 
you send a number of troops simultaneously to each of those regions, and the other person does the same. And then you reveal. Whoever wins the most regions wins the game. So you need to win two regions out of three to win. How many troops do I allocate to each region to optimally win the game? Now, you could play the Blotto game with people. It's a very simple game. If you study the Blotto game, you'll see it exists in other games. In El Grande, look at this. It looks like a bunch of troops in a bunch of different regions. And lo and behold, there's victory points for having the most troops in a region at a certain time. Now, there's a whole mechanic of getting troops onto the board. It's not pure Colonel Blotto. But if you understand this fundamental concept of the idea of how do I allocate resources between a number of disparate places when someone else is doing the same to maximize my payout, you'll find that that exists in the majority of games you play. So now we're going to define some more terms because this is where game theory gets even more interesting. Perfect information is a construct that it exists in game theory. People usually define this at the beginning of any talk about game theory, but it's usually not very useful. Perfect information means something very specific. It means I know everything that has happened in the entire course of the game up to this point. I mean, you know, how many games do you play where it's like you don't know everything? You know, in StarCraft is a fog of war. You don't know what the other guy did for the past five minutes because he shot all your scouts out of the sky, right? You know a little bit. You know he has the things that shoot your scouts out of the sky. But that's about it, right? But if you play maybe without the fog of war or if you play chess, it's like you can just rewind and look at every move that was made. There is no secret thing that has happened. Nobody's holding a hidden card that they've drawn that you don't know about, right? There are no mysteries, whatever. Both players have all of the information. It is perfect information. Now, this has certain ramifications, but it does not have any effect on the solvability of games. A lot of people don't like the idea that games are solvable, but games are eminently solvable. A lot of people think that, oh yes, a game like chess is solvable because it's perfect information, but you can't solve games where people act simultaneously. No, you can solve those games just the same. There are certain ramifications of perfect information. You can't have simultaneous turns in a game that is perfect information. By definition, if we can act simultaneously, the decision that affected my turn just now, I didn't know the decision that was made. I was acting without knowing the perfect information of what he did. Mm -hmm. So perfect information games are completely distinct from complete information games. Right. A complete information game is where you know all the rules, which is why we have the hockey rules up there. Right? So if I know all the rules, I know the payoff matrix, I know all the possible strategies you can use, the game is a complete information game. Right, you know, chess is also a complete information, right? You look at the board, you know, every single move he could possibly make on his next turn. It's equal to the number of pieces he has. That's how many moves, well, even greater than that, because he could move it this way or that way. So. You know, it's, it's how many moves he can make, you know, every single possible move he can make in theory. But there are games where you don't know everything the other guy could do. If he's got a hand of cards and you don't know what cards are in that hand, you don't know what he could do in his next turn. Imagine the gathering. Does now maybe you know oh. the possibility of all the po total set of cards he could have in his hand. So rather than get into the minutia of the edge cases of complete and perfect information, consider the interesting ramifications of different combinations. What's the difference between a perfect complete information game or a perfect non-complete information game? Can you think of an example of a game that has perfect information but not complete information? So you know everything that's already happened, but you don't know everything that could happen. You don't know the rules. And a toy example is a game where we're playing chess on a board with chess pieces. We make chess moves every turn. I win if I get my king two spaces up and one space to the right. If I get him to that square, I immediately win. Scott wins if he does some other thing. We don't know what the two of us are doing. I don't know what he's after, he doesn't know what I, I'm after. It's a perfect information game, but it's not a complete information game. So think about perfect and complete, and practically think about every game you play, is it perfect, is it complete? And then think about that game in terms of other games that are the same combination of perfect and complete, and you'll start to see a lot of really interesting parallels between all these games. So. Most people, when they think about game theory, they think about analyzing games, solving games. You know how we got into game theory? Scott I went, went to the RIT library. And I saw a book of one of those blue library bound books and it said game theory on the side of it. And I'm like, I like games. It's a library. <laughs> this is free. I will take this back to the apartment. We were really into German board games. Like we just learned about Settlers of Catan and Carcassonne. This is in the year 2000. Where Puerto Rico came guys. out, blew our minds. 
So we decided that we were going to double down on this. We wanted to win these games. So let's read these game theory books. And it's all about hawks and doves and old people. <laughs> There's lots of math. So we're going to talk about how to analyze games and how the concepts of game theory are used to analyze games. And we're going to skip the math. Because we don't know it. <laughs> Scott usually makes that joke. So let's talk about a very simple game we've talked about a lot, rock, paper, scissors. Is there a good, pure strategy for rock, paper, scissors? A pure strategy means you have decided what you're going to do every time you play the game. Is it possible to have a pure strategy in rock, paper, scissors <laughs> that is in any way effective? And the answer is no. So what you want to use instead, rock, paper, scissors is solved by having a mixed strategy. Uh, my strategy for rock, paper, scissors is to play rock, paper, or scissors randomly, each one of them 33.3 .3 repeating percent of the time. Now, it's impossible to actually play this strategy as a human being because human beings cannot really generate randomness in their head very well. Right? In fact, Even it's one you, of the things humans are the worst at. Right. It's like you might think you're playing randomly, but really you're not, right? If you actually had a computer do it, the computer, there would be strings of like five or six rocks in a row. There would be like some, you know, a whole bunch of scissors in a row over there. If you have a human do what they think is random, there's going to be a lot more mixing up. It's going to be like rock, paper, scissors, maybe two scissors in a row, but never that three usually, right? Now, humans can get good at acting randomly. It is an extremely difficult skill to build. And I'd recommend you try it, come up with a way to act randomly. If anything, find someone like us and try to write a string of ones and zeros and try to make it random. And we can probably eyeball it and tell you if it was randomly yeah, have generated a com have a by a computer yeah. or by you. Have a computer print out a random string of ones and zeros and then write a string of ones and zeros with your hand. Print them both out and show them to like a, 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 you know, a mathematician or a probability or a statistician. They'll say, that one's not random. You can just tell by looking at it. It's, it's obvious. But the perfect strategy solution to paper, rock, scissors, if everyone is rational, is to play completely randomly. And as a pragmatic tip, in many games, if decisions are arbitrary, it is in your best interest to act as randomly as possible. There's a lot of games where it's like, you know, you've got three things to pick from and they're all pretty equal. You just, the best thing you can do is shuffle them up and pick one randomly. The thing is, in a lot of games, there might not be cards to shuffle up or a die to roll and you have to determine randomly without a mechanism. And it could be said that, you know, a lot of you will bring a die and like use it to help them pick randomly. Sometimes that can be considered cheating. I mean, I'm gonna bring my steroids to the bike race. That's okay, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'll admit. If it's the steroid bike race. What I will do, I'll, I'll let you into my secret heuristic. We'll talk about heuristics at the end. That's kind of the whole, we're driving toward heuristics. Is that I'll look at a watch or I'll look at a clock or something and I'll, I'll come up with some decision-making matrix like I'll always break right if the, the second hand is odd when I look at the clock. I'm cheating, basically. <laughs> now, we're the interesting part about practical game theory is that we're not in a perfect world. We know humans are bad at this. So how do we be better than the perfect strategy against humans? Because we've, we're detecting that humans are going to act irrationally. There's a computer algorithm that does this. It'll beat any one of you at paper, rock, scissors reliably. And the way it does this is as you play, it keeps track of every throw you did and it figures out your cognitive biases. It is mapping your brain's random number generator and over time, it will beat you 100% of the time. It is uncanny. So as a person- But if you point it against itself, it's 33%. Obviously. Well, unless you're using the pseudo random number generator, in which case it might figure out the secret. Right, the if you had, way. say, a, a piece of cesium tr creating true random numbers in one computer and just a normal, like, you know, Intel Core 2 Duo generating random numbers in the other computer, eventually the cesium would beat the Core 2 Duo over time. <laughs> or you could argue that the cesium would cause the other computer to itself become perfectly random. It would approach true randomness over time and things get tricky, but we're not gonna get into all those details. <laughs> so, there's an old heuristic for paper, rock, scissors that's very interesting. This really hits on the idea of discovering the irrationality of your opponents. The heuristic that I use is I figure out how many steps away from an idiot child is the person I'm playing. <laughs> Assuming they are American. So kids tend to throw scissors. Because scissors, cutting is dangerous. I mean, you're not allowed to run with scissors. You're not even allowed to have scissors. Yeah, sometimes. they can have rocks and paper, right? But scissors are like the most dangerous. Rocks like second most dangerous. So I know a kid is going to throw scissors more often. He's definitely going to throw scissors first. So I know how to beat him. I'll just throw a rock. And I'll throw a rock more often. 
Now, that kid's going to figure it out. When he's one step away from an imbecilic child, what he's going to do is think, I know that everyone thinks I threw scissors first. So I'm going to throw the thing that beats the thing that beats scissors. So if you step through these iterations, Scott is about 17 iterations away from an imbecile child. How do you count this? <laughs> so you can use heuristics like that to figure out the other person's irrationality. Watch for players who deviate from perfect play and try to exploit that. Uh, in fact, a really good example of that in multiplayer games. You've all been at that table of packs where one guy is just not as bright as everyone else, not playing as well as everyone else. Among smart players, people who play games and are serious about them, the game becomes exploit him. <laughs> exploit his randomness or exploit his poor play to benefit the rest of us. Yeah, and it's like someone's playing Settlers or Genoa or a game of trading especially, right? And they're really bad. It's like, who can rip off that guy the most, <laughs> right? Is eventually that guy, he's playing so badly, but he actually ends up mattering more than the good players. It's, the good players is just like, well, there's a bunch of pile of free resources. How many free resources can I get out of that pile? Now, back to this whole idea of pure versus mixed strategies. The best strategies in real games tend to be mixed strategies. If I go craftsman captain every time I play Puerto Rico, I become a very predictable player, and it's very easy for Scott to exploit that. I'm basically acting irrationally by having a too predictable uh, sort of mechanism to captain the before strategy. you captain. So I'll have a strategy like I'll play craftsman captain 80% of the time, but 20% of the time I go factory. Now, anyone who's played Puerto Rico a lot, those should be reversed. Factory is the game winner. Factory, there's a, there's a good mod for Puerto Rico where you switch the prices of the factory and the university, and anyone who starts with an indigo gets one doubloon extra to start with. It really so, makes the game crazy. One way to solve games is brute force. Just try every possible combination. Now, Tic-Tac-Toe <laughs> has about 20,000 unique board piece, like placements. I would positions. hope everyone in this room has solved Tic-Tac-Toe. <laughs> <laughs> now... Player Many of those are redundant, but that's not really the point. Connect 4 is somewhat more complex. Checkers, that's a 10 followed by 20 zeros, if you don't know how that notation works. 20 zeros. Uh, Connect 4 was solved many years ago. There is an absolute solution to Connect 4. Checkers was solved several years ago. By some Canadians with some crazy computers. It took 19 years and 200 computers to figure out Checkers. The solution to checkers is if you play perfectly, both players can guaranteedly force a draw. So the game is a draw if people play perfectly. Chess is somewhat more complex. That's actually a rough estimate. We don't even know how many possible positions there are in chess. It is somewhere between 10 to the 43 and 10 to the 50 something. And Go what is What size a, Go board is that? That is a 19 by 19 Go board. Go will probably never be solved. Unless and you have chess, a quantum computer is some ridiculous shit. Chess will that. likely not be solved with the technology we have available us today. Now, you are not going to brute force your games, but you can understand games that can be brute forced and understand how complex games are and how strategies combine. And just even knowing how complex a game is gives you a lot of insight into what heuristics to use to be better at that game. This is going to make a lot more sense at the very end of this lecture. So just remember that brute force has basically petered out already with modern technology. Combinatorial game theory is a relatively recent and relatively neat theory of games. And I learned it from my seventh grade math teacher. He taught me a game called NIM. And NIM is very simple. Draw some number of sticks in three or four or five columns. And every turn, you take turns removing some number of sticks from a column. You can't remove sticks from two columns at once. You have to pick a column and remove some number of sticks from that column. Whoever picks up the last stick loses. So you want to leave the other person with one stick left in one column so that they're forced to take that stick. Because you have to take at least one. Now it turns out combinatorial game theory, which is the idea that if there is a game and another game and you add those games together, you can do fairly simple math and determine... Like, if I've solved this game and I've solved this game and I add them together, I know the solution to this game by using combinatorial game theory. So, for example, Nim with just one stick, guess what? The player who goes first loses because they have to pick up <laughs> that one stick. Nim with two sticks is a different game, and Nim with two sticks, the player who goes first wins because they pick one stick and the second player takes the other stick. Nim with three sticks, Nim the with first three player sticks. still wins. Player one wins. In other words, <laughs> Nim with one stick plus Nim with two sticks equals Nim with three sticks which is 
player who goes first wins, right? Therefore, right, it's player goes first wins plus player second wins equals player first wins. You can combine the games with a plus sign and get another game and know the answer to the third game by just adding the first two games together. Now, what's interesting is that some games are more uh, resolvable by combinatorial game theory than others. Tic-tac-toe is actually surprisingly difficult to express in that, uh, in that way. It's hard to solve tic-tac-toe as a person using combinatorial game theory. But if you know the solution to NIM, if you've looked at the equation, you can calculate in your head who wins, no matter how big that, it could be a million six in the first one, 9,000 in the second one, eight in the fourth one, 40 in the fifth one. You can look at it and immediately know who's gonna win, assuming people play perfectly. But assuming people play perfectly, the way to get good at games like this and all the games that are derived from games like this is to play NIM. Literally, all of you should, around packs, take pieces of paper and play NIM. Just draw like five sticks, three sticks, two sticks, take turns removing some number of sticks and the last person to pick one up loses. And you'll start to notice all these patterns. You'll notice if the game gets to this state where there's two sticks here and two sticks here, this player always yeah. wins. Because some game with a big number of sticks, you played it a bunch, a bunch of sticks are missing, and now it's a new game. It's the game with only that many sticks. You might as well have started with that many sticks, and the answer to the big game is the same as the answer to that small so game you got So eventually, you're going to figure out you're not playing to get the game to the end. You've memorized this list of 20... Conditions that if you get to that you win You're now just playing to get the game to that point and then the game's over because you know you win So if you're doing that and other people aren't you are way ahead of them in terms of winning this game And after you do that you'll start to you'll start to figure out like the fullness of this game Then I want you to go and read a book by Richard Garfield and some other people called characteristics of games in the back of that book There's an appendix in that appendix. He explains the math of combinatorial game theory if you figure out NIM and get good at it and read that, you will understand this surprisingly complex area of mathematics in a surprisingly intuitive way. And you'll be better at games that involve this because you have learned that pattern recognition is the key to winning games. If you can recognize the pattern that wins the game before someone else, this guy's playing for the end. You're playing for the pattern. He doesn't see what you're doing. You're gonna win because you're going for something he doesn't realize it's important yet. More importantly, players who play NIM, if you don't know how to play, you're all gonna do the same thing. It's how humans solve problems. You are going to act randomly until you have figured out who won. You do this in every game you play, whether or not you realize it. If you play Go, how many of you play Go? We got a few. All right, so Go has almost non-existent heuristics, both directional and positional, which we'll talk about in a second. As a result, you don't know how to evaluate whether or not a move you're making is good or not. It takes a lot of learning to even get to the point of knowing if you're doing well in Go. As a result, you will play randomly until you notice, oh, that pattern appeared, now I can circle that thing and win. So every time you're playing games, think about this. What am I doing? And the answer is almost always going to be, oh, I'm acting randomly because I don't know what to do. So as soon as you get good at a game, try to recognize when other players are clearly acting randomly and use that to your advantage. You'll know if they've solved the game or not. You know what to shoot for. So this is kind of, we're building up to this, heuristics. Now I mentioned it once, I'll mention it again. There's a book by Richard Garfield. You may know him. He made some moderately popular games. Yeah, I don't know. You might have heard of them. Magic the Gathering. Yeah, something like that. Uh, Not Android, that popular. Netrunner. Not that popular. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So this book, if you're interested in games, game theory at all, you should read this book. Every one of you should read this book. We're going to throw out If you terms. care enough to be in this room, you should read this book. Yeah. So we're going to talk about something called heuristics. Now heuristics are part of how humans work. They're a part of how games work, they're the whole point of this, because you, even if you're super good at Puerto Rico, I'm super good at Puerto Rico, I do some math, I do make some calculations in the course of the game. I am not calculating the entirety of the game. That might be larger than chess. That might be more difficult, it is impossible for me to do, I'm not that smart, none of us are. I'm using a heuristic to figure out how to play the game, and I'm using math to augment that heuristic. This is a diagram of something called the gaze heuristic. <laughs> the gaze heuristic is something that human beings use and you all use it. If you're running to catch a ball, someone throws a ball, like baseball, and you're trying to catch it, 
Maybe you're crazy and you're using differential equations and calculus to calculate the trajectory to predict where the ball will land and then you're running to that point. But if you watch people, they don't, you, someone throws a ball, they're not looking at where they predicted it landed and running to it. They're looking at the ball and running. They are not predicting where the ball is going. Humans almost have no ability to predict where something will land based on when it was shot. Yeah, imagine if all, you were playing baseball and you could watch the guy swing and hit, and then they closed your eyes and you had to go and stand in the spot where it was going to land and catch it like that. It's not going to happen. You think you can predict where things will land. You can't very quickly. And even if you do learn how to do that, your body will not do that when you're trying to catch something. It will fall back on the gaze heuristic. This is built into your brain. Your head will lock at an angle looking at the object and keep the object at the same angle no matter what. And mathematically, it just so happens that if you do that, the ball will end up in your hands. Because you have to move forward, it is forcing you to catch the ball no matter what. So think about this the next time you're playing baseball. Imagine, realize that your neck's not moving. You're locking the gaze. That is a heuristic. It is a sort of soft or fuzzy way, a rule to follow, that if you follow it, it's pretty much guaranteed to make the ball land in your hand. Or, if you're doing what I said and you're thinking about this, it's going to hit you in the face. This is why they say, <laughs> why they say keep your eye on the ball. So in games, there are two kinds of heuristics. Directional heuristics and positional heuristics. So directional heuristic is which direction do I go, right? It's a method you are using to figure out, do I do this or do I do that? You have multiple choices or some kind of decision to make. The heuristic, directional heuristic is how do I figure out which of the decisions I'll make, which way will I go? For example, uh, one that I like to use is in power grid when I'm bidding on power plants, right? I will look at the power plant and I will say, all right, how, I need that power plant to win the game. It's a big one. I need it. I, I want it. How much am I willing to pay for it? Well, if I buy that, I will have to spend this much money to buy resources this turn. I put that money aside. Then I say, okay, how much money do I want to spend on houses this turn? I can power up to this many houses. It would be nice to buy that many. It will cost this. I put that money aside. And the remaining money is the money I'll spend in the power plant. And Not a perfect strategy, but no. does very well. It's a very good strategy. Offloads more complex processing from Scott's <laughs> brain because he just follows the rule he came up with to a fault, and he puts the money aside on the table, and no, I can no. see what he's, yes, you I do. Like this. You go like this, you're like, eh, eh, no, nah. and I know what you're doing. That's why I win Power Grid. You don't win Power Grid. <laughs> you haven't won that in a while. So, I mean, look, in all games, directional heuristics, it's telling you which way to go. Do you want to fall off that rickety-ass bridge into the deep chasm, the darkness below arise the screams of the undead? No, this is actually a bridge right here. And you know what, in the game, if you walk up here, you're fine. If you walk up here, you die. <laughs> Unless you come back after drinking potion two. I don't know. Anyway. I like that extra torch you got. So think about what I said before with Go. Go has no reasonably useful directional heuristics for beginner players. They just don't exist. So when you're playing Go, you're just acting randomly. By default, your first directional heuristic is act randomly. Your second directional heuristic is act randomly until I figure out how to win the game. Or act to max it, like if there's victory points. I'll just do whatever gives me the most victory points. That's usually not the best strategy, but you know what? It's better than completely random. If you play a game that everyone at the table just read the rules to and no one knows how to play, best thing to do is to skip over the act randomly and go straight for get the most victory points. You will win that first game 99% of the time. Now, you have to construct increasingly complex heuristics to know what to do. A directionally heuristic in Go involves such crazy crap as how many areas of the board are still alive, how many pieces are there still that are going to be played, because you know how to calculate that. Uh, is the other guy working on this area of the board or this area of the board? You have this whole huge heuristic in your head. But you're not calculating that, because as we know, you can't calculate ch Go. I was going to say chess and checkers at the same time, and I said Go instead. And Scott is simultaneously yawning. That's right. <laughs> So forcing, yeah. what you're going to do is you're going to recognize patterns in Go. You, you know these very tiny sub-games, just like in NIM, combinatorial game theory. You recognize this one pattern is a win for this player. This one pattern is a win for this player. If this pattern exists, do this and this and this to turn it into points for you to win the game. 
You build this lexicon of little strategies, of little games, and you use those to construct a directional heuristic, and that is how you win games. Game theory just lets you construct extremely effective heuristics without having to do the math every time. Uh, in the panel before, I said learn modulus math. When I play games with rondels, I use modulus math to figure out the cycle, and then I use that cycle to populate my heuristic. Knowing modulus math lets me calculate that very quickly. And because we're running out of time, positional heuristics, I put them last, they're actually more important. Who's winning a game? Who knows? It's almost impossible for people to actually know who's winning games. Right, even if you play something like Carcassonne, you can see there's a victory point track. You can see someone's at the front of that track. They already have 50 points. No one else has anything. And but Rim's at the back. I've got less points than everyone. But Am we I can see you? on the board that Rim's farm has a whole bunch of farms in it. And we can also see that he's got a guy, a big meeple, in a city that will likely finish and is worth like 30 points. So Rim is in first place. So using the positional heuristic of count the points on the board is much better than look at the scoring track, which lies to you. <laughs> yep, and Mario Kart. Kart, it lies to you. Yeah, it says Mario's in first place. No, blue shell. He's not in first place, guys. And you might think, no, no, he was in first place. They caught up. No, he was never in first place. You were just using the wrong positional heuristic. So going back to all this game theory stuff, no, theory stuff, knowing where you are, whether or not you're winning or losing, is crucial to forming your heuristics. Because, for example, if you're falling behind in a game, you want to act more randomly. You want to attack decreasing odds for greater gain, because that's the only way to catch up. You have to actually know you're behind. A lot of people lose games because they don't realize they're behind. Right, like, you know, a football team, the only way you could win now, guys, is to do a Hail Mary, but what if you didn't know that you were losing? You looked at the scoreboard, and right? You thought you were about to win, and you're dumb. But the point is that you construct these heuristics by using the pieces of the game theory games from that Wikipedia page that you all need to go and look at that lists game theory games, and the more of those games you study and understand, it'll take you a few minutes to get the gist of some of these. And you'll start to be able to construct really advanced heuristics, and none of your friends are ever going to want to play games with you again. <laughs> now, the point is, though, beyond all that, is that you have to actually play these games. Because, sure, you can make the best heuristics in the world. You can study the game theory, memorize everything we just said. You've got the perfect strategy to beat all your friends in Puerto Rico. But if you don't actually play with people, you're not going to be able to do that intuitively. You're not going to be able to do it quickly. You're going to be stuck calculating. People are going to be yelling at you to take your turn. You're going to lose count of the cards, and then it's all over. No one wants to play with you. The only reason we know this stuff is a combination of reading Wikipedia, reading that Richard Garfield book, and playing Puerto Rico 20 to 30 times a day over the course of an entire summer. Yeah, a lot of you people, right, you don't play games enough, right? It's like these people that come to tabletop, and it's like, I played Power Grid a few times. Dude, there was a time when I was playing Power Grid every day, right? Maybe twice a day, right? And that's, you have to do something a lot to get good. It's practice, right? But practice from one <laughs> game transfers over to another. So you really just play games like crazy. If that is what you're into, do it more, a lot more. And on that note, I'm afraid we have to end because we both have to go on shift as enforcers in negative two minutes. No. Uh, I have an earlier shift because I'm in main theater. That's tough. So we will not have time to take questions. If you take one of those flyers, email us a question. Those flyers are really old. Those flyers from 2005. Just ignore everything on them but the URL. But if you email us, we will try to put the video of the previous lecture that you all missed because you were in line for this one online. And we will also try to answer your questions, perhaps in video form associated with the video of this panel. Or perhaps in the newsletter. You can show it to your friends to make them better at games. You cannot show it to them so you'll beat them at games. <laughs>